Hello everybody, I'm Dr. Jordan Taylor, Undergraduate Exercise Science Program Director and Associate Teaching Professor at the University of Kansas. I'm here with Dr. Phil Gallagher, Professor at the University of Kansas and Director of the Applied Physiology Laboratory. We're going to provide a tour of his lab, discuss the type of research conducted in the lab, and talk about some of the equipment and instruments that are used in this lab for research purposes. I also have PhD student Jeremy Pearson. It's going to be talking about uh, some of the instruments and, and lab equipment as well. So what type of research is conducted here in your applied physiology laboratory, and then why is that research important? Good, good question. So um, my main research is, actually I have two main lines of research. So the first line of research is in skeletal muscle physiology. And primarily with that, what we're looking at is ways to cause muscle cells to grow and ways to prevent it from atrophying. And we're more looking at it from not so much an athletic population, but more so from a clinical population, trying to maintain skeletal muscle health. And the other line of research has to do with uh, immune function and exercise. So we're looking at primarily T cells, how these T cells get activated with exercise, what's causing them to be activated, and that way we can increase the immune system or help the immune system uh, for individuals that might be immunocompromised, for example. That's an area not a lot of people think about is the link between exercise and the immune system. Um, I think it's, it's often overlooked, but um, obviously a healthy amount of exercise is going to strengthen your immune system. And uh, well, what are some of the things you're wanting to look at there maybe with, you know, your T cell studies and I mean, right. any of highlight, highlight any of those studies? Sure. Uh, so we started this uh, line of research basically with the whole notion that thinking that uh, individuals that do really high intensity exercise, they're, everyone's been showing that their immune system becomes compromised. So we then, well, let's just see if that actually happens, especially with T cells. Uh, so we did a study where we compared a really, really high intensity exercise for 90 minutes versus a moderate intensity exercise for 90 minutes. And the group that did the high intensity exercise, their T cells activated extremely high. The moderate intensity exercise didn't hardly activate at all. Uh, so we actually found the exact opposite of what everyone right. else is finding. So higher intensity exercise was more beneficial as far as from a T cell response standpoint. Right. Um, so better immune system activation. You can think of your T cells as little defenders um, in the immune system. You know, you've got cytotoxic and T helper cells, but they're basically an important component of the immune system and defending against microorganisms, viruses, bacteria, et cetera. So you actually saw high intensity exercise improve the T cell response and basically you had better defense yes. after high intensity yeah. versus moderate intensity good, good exercise. Point. So, like, so T cells are part of what's called the adaptive immunity where um, they would adapt to any kind of incoming infection. They need to, have, they need to be presented with what's called an antigen, by an antigen presenting cells like a, a macrophage will come in, gobble up a bacteria for example, and that will present that bacteria. Like on a through. serving plate, like yeah. hey, here's this bacteria I got, now do something with the it. The T cell will come in and recognize it and say, okay, I need to attack that, whatever that, whatever that bacteria was. Yeah. Um, until that happens, it's really just a, cell floating around in your in your body. Um, what we found actually though is that these T cells will proliferate like mad after high intensity exercise. Um, but they just don't know what they're gonna fight. They haven't been told we need to fight something. Um, again that needs to be right. specific. And then the interesting thing about T cells too, we're going off on this whole T cell tangent, but it's like when that macrophage or an antigen presenting cell presents that you know piece of a bacteria to the T cells and they're activated T cells, like helper T cells, can actually activate B cells, which differentiate to plasma cells, and then those cells produce antibodies. Yep. And I don't know, is that another route you may look at down the road, is uh, further on down the immune system line, like maybe looking at antibody responses and things like that? Actually, we're probably going to go more to the innate immunity. Okay. So we have the adaptive immunity, which mainly looking at T cells for us. Again, B cells are part of that adaptive immunity. We'll potentially be looking at some innate immunity uh, as well. So innate okay. immunity, they don't need to be presented with antigen. If anything comes into the body that needs to be attacked, they'll just... Attack. It's like first line of defense, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's really interesting. All right, well, we have uh, Jeremy Pearson over here, a PhD student. Just did his comp. Getting on, getting, we're doing his dissertation work right now. Excited about that. You're on the downhill slope a little bit. So we're going to talk about some of the equipment that is used in this lab, and I guess that gets to number two, is, is what do you measure in the lab, and what types of equipment and instruments? instrumentation do you use for conducting your research? Right, so with the main line of research, which is the skeletal muscle physiology, um, 
Jeremy's actually looking at uh, what are called satellite cells. So these satellite cells uh, are different than a, a regular muscle cells. They're still considered a type of muscle cell, but they're also considered a stem cell. So we talk about adult skeletal muscle, it is post-mitotic. For the most part, it cannot go through cell replication. So in order for us to get new muscle or potentially repair that muscle, we need satellite cells. And I'll have Jeremy explain that here in a little bit. But and they're called satellite cells because they're kind of on the periphery of the muscle fibers. Yeah. So yes, they're sir. kind of orbiting around like a satellite would orbit Earth, right? Yeah. So we'll have Jeremy explain what his research is here in a little bit. But in order to get muscle, we mainly deal with humans. We have to get a muscle sample. And this is what this needle would is for. So I should call it a muscle biopsy needle. There are two main parts to it. A very sharp blade in our needle that has a sharp blade all the way around it. And this outer needle... Uh, that has a point to it, but it's not super sharp. And then has a window on it as well. Uh, so after we obviously clean the area, anesthetize the area with a local anesthetic, very similar to what you know, having a cavity work done, that's what would be the uh, local anesthetic. I'll make a small incision about a centimeter long and go in with a specialized needle. This is obviously one we don't use anymore. Um, the new ones obviously be sterilized. Uh, with that window shut so that inner needle would be all the way closed. After I go in, I'll draw back on that inner needle. This will be actually put on here. And then Jeremy will draw suction, what we call, on that, on this device here. And that will then literally suck a piece of muscle into that window. I'll snip off that section, turn the outer barrel 180 degrees, and then we'll do the same exact thing. And we get samples that are about the size of an, of an eraser on a pencil. Um, and it's amazing what we can do with that. And again, one of the things that uh, we're going to do is look at satellite cells, and I'll let Jeremy explain a little bit. Oh, and then, so what muscle groups do you most commonly sample with the biopsy needle? Uh, good question. So we mainly uh, sample the, uh, get the samples from the best of that or else, which is the outside of the thigh. And we try to aim towards the peripheral, uh, sorry, the, the proximal portion of that, uh, of that uh, thigh, actually the distal, sorry, the distal portion of that thigh, because we're looking at... Um, uh, but that muscle, the, the, the thigh muscle in particular, the best else gets activated with a lot of things that we do, um, especially with resistance training, which is one thing we look at to try and preserve skeletal muscle. Obviously, resistance training is a main part to that. Um, so best of else is nice because also the, the main muscle nerve comes in the middle of the, of the, of the thigh, and then it spreads out from there, so we have a really low risk of actually injuring some nerves. Right, right. That makes sense. Safety first, right? When you're going to be taking a chunk of a muscle out, right? Anything else you want to mention as far as biopsy satellite cells? Satellite cells. Yeah, why don't you explain your study? Yeah, sure. So, yeah, I'm a fourth year PhD student in Dr. Gallagher's lab, and for the past three and a half years now, I have been studying these satellite cells or these muscle specific stem cells that, you know, I tell people when you exercise or when you have any physical activity and you're sore the next day and the next day and the next day, but that next day, you're not sore. How does that happen? So I look at that. I look at how these muscle stem cells are activating and they're going to latch onto that muscle and regenerate that muscle. And what I'm specifically looking at for my dissertation is how muscle stem cells or these satellite cells are going to activate and regenerate that muscle in people that have been working out for years and years, about 10 years, versus someone that's never exercised before. Right. And that's very common in exercise science research is you see differences in training responses if you compare untrained individuals to trained, right? Yeah. All right. So we moved next door uh, to an adjacent room. This is still part of the Applied Physiology Laboratory. So Dr. Gallo is going to talk about some of the equipment instrumentation in this room because there's a lot of hardcore basic science research that goes on in here. So I think when People have the idea of a laboratory in their mind. This is kind of what they envision, you know, with the microscopes. We've got an RT-PCR machine, look at gene expression, the fumid, pipettes, all this cool stuff in here. So I'm going to turn it over to you, kind of talk about what you look at in here. So, you know, we talked about the muscle biopsy needle, and you get a chunk of muscle tissue. Now you bring it over here, and we got to process the tissue, do some different things with it. What are we going to look at? What are you doing here? Yeah, so again, my research is a little more cellular, uh, biochemical, and molecular biology in nature. Uh, so if you take that muscle sample, for example, you have to process it. Uh, and one of the things we may do if I, is look at gene expression. So we look at what genes get turned on or what genes potentially get turned off with exercise. 
or any other intervention where you have some sort of uh, uh, pharmaceutical intervention potentially, um, we might look at that as well. In order to do that... Supplements, uh, nutrition, things yeah. like that, how they affect the genes, right? In order to do that, though, we need to actually do what's called uh, uh, real-time RT-PCR, our polymer chain reaction. And that's this piece of equipment right here. You can just see the back of it. Um, but what that will do is act, uh, actually amplify the amount of gene product that's there. And eventually get to a point, it'll amplify it. Every time it goes through what's called a cycle, it'll double the amount of genes that are in that tissue or in that sample. And eventually get to a point where you can actually, there's some machine washing, measure it. Mm -hmm. um, eventually it'll max out though. Um, so you're looking at somewhere between that maximum or saturated level to when you can detect it. That'd be somewhere in the middle there of that. Uh, and, in, and you compare, for example, pre-training versus post-training or pre-exercise versus post-exercise. Uh, and then you can see if the gene expression went up or if it went down. Right. And then again, just genes, remember, they're located on your DNA. And when he says gene expression, literally what's happening is when a gene is expressed due to some stimulus, right? It could be the type of exercise program. It could be some, like you said, pharmaceutical intervention or nutritional. There's different things that can switch on genes and they're expressed. So the gene starts making copies of itself and the copy is called messenger RNA. And then that messenger RNA gets fed through what are called ribosomes, these little cellular organelles. And the ribosome reads that copy of the gene and says, okay, now I need to make a protein, right? So on that messenger RNA, there's little coded letters, tells the ribosome what protein to make. And then that protein may get integrated into the muscle tissue, like it may be an actin or myosin protein. It could be an enzyme that gets created. I mean, there's a lot of different uh, types of proteins in the body, but gene expression is telling the ribosomes what protein to make. So that's one reason why it's, it's looked at. You want to add any, anything yeah, else so to we, that? So we also look at, at the protein expression as well. We do that through a process that's called Western immunoblotting or potentially ELISA, but we prefer the Western immunoblotting. Uh, that's a little bit more uh, a complicated a system um, and the fact that we have to do some multi-day process. Um, Jeremy, my PhD student, is over there. You can't see him in the, in the shot, but he's, uh, he doesn't like doing them. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but we do get some good data. So we get data, again, on the, on the, on the gene expression level, and we get on the protein level. Um, and that's a lot of times what we do with skeletal muscle. Other than the imaging, we also do some imaging work, and that's what actually what Jeremy's working on. Uh, for the most part, we do our imaging work over in the core lab, uh, which is called the Microscopy Analytical Imaging Lab. Um, that's over you know, across the street in Hayworth. Um, so we have a good relationship with the, the, the director there. And we do some a fair amount of work uh, with the uh, fluorescent microscopy and then potentially some electron microscopy as well. Anything else you want to discuss in this lab? We move oh, on to sure. the next question or sure. more, so, uh, more discussion? We do okay. with T cells because we do it the way that we uh, analyze our T cells is um, uh, we have to have a very sterile environment. And that's what this, what's called a biosafety cabinet, is for. And so it's a laminar flow hood. It's not really a typical film hood like you would see in a, in a, in a, in a lab. But this is actually for us just to keep everything basically sterile. Uh, so it has an UV light on it, we can sterilize all the equipment in here, and then it'll do this laminar flow, run it through a, a filter, to make sure that everything stays uh, relatively sterile. And then we can do some, some cell culturing after that. Um, and again, we need to make sure that there's no fungus or bacteria in our samples. All righty. Um, can you discuss some of the favorite studies that you've conducted in the lab, uh, maybe highlight some of that research? So with uh, the T cells in particular, when the, the biggest thing that we found was actually that the fact that, again, high intensity exercise so actually activates the T cells, doesn't uh, right. cause them to be inhibited like everyone thought. Uh, so there is no immunocompromisation that happens with, with exercise, at least high intensity exercise. Uh, that's probably the coolest thing that we saw. Right. We're following that up with a couple other studies. Now that was an acute study, acute but study. of course, if you did that high intensity exercise at that level over weeks and months without rest, yep. now we're looking at chronic. Right. So maybe right. chronic overtraining, I wonder what you think, what would the T cell response there be? Potentially, uh, it, they've got some immune compr compromising happening in there. Um, the reason why everyone originally thought that high intensity exercise caused immuno, uh, it caused the immune system to be compromised was a lot of these marathon studies, for example, looking at marathoners, they get higher instances of upper, upper respiratory tract infection, uh, post-marathon. Um, so everyone was thinking it was the marathon that did it. 
Well, what they didn't take into account is they're hanging out with hundreds and hundreds of people. A lot of people flew there on an airplane, uh, so they, and they're all a little bit stressed out because of the marathon itself. Their diet's a little bit different. That's probably what's causing uh, the immune system to be compromised, those upper respiratory tract infections to occur. Right. Not, Not the exercise. The exercise itself, right. 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 That makes sense. All right. Any other studies highlight or move on to the last question? Okay. So what would you like to investigate as far as future research in the lab? Is there any directions based on, you know, these current studies you just talked about? Are they, are they pointing you or steering you in, in other directions? Let's start with the muscle first. So we're looking again with uh, Jeremy's research, looking at, uh, at the satellite cells. And we're going to follow up with that, looking at more how satellite cells get activated uh, what, um, how, the, how the structure might change with exercise uh, or muscle damage. So we're going to follow up with satellite cell uh, pathways of activation. So I think so. Yeah, how they actually get activated and then kind of, they kind of like merge with muscle fibers are involved, like uh, Jeremy said earlier, with repair and regenerating and, and donating nuclei because muscle is, is multinucleated. So um, more nuclei, you would think you would get more gene expression, more protein response, potentially. I mean, I'm talking here but um yeah they're really interesting those satellite cells so look those up as far as immune research yep. anything you want to talk about there yeah, the immune research we're following that up currently we're working on a study where we're trying to find the mechanisms of how these satellite cells not satellite cells, sorry t cells get activated all these t cells actually get activated what's what about exercise is causing them to be activated and proliferate um and where's where is that coming from is it coming from the cell the cells themselves or is it coming from a signal outside the cell that's causing that to happen? So we're looking at um, one study where we're what we call a crossover study, where we have four different conditions. Again, we're going to um, have the T cells that we isolate, and we're going to put them pre or post exercise, and we're going to bathe them or isolate or um, um, basically bathe them in a, in a solution that contains pre and post blood, exercise blood, uh, and then we're going to see if is it something from coming from the blood or is it coming from from the T cells themselves that are causing them to activate. So remember, look at some genes that are associated with cell proliferation or activation uh, as well from that. Um, so again, we're just basically looking at what is causing these T cells to get activated as a result of high intensity exercise. All right. Any other future research? You think that's uh, and then another, it? another thing we're looking at, and this is not related to what Jeremy's going on, but we are, are going to start a study looking at um, what's called the triad, and you can learn about excitation and contraction coupling in class. Well, that's actually what we're going to be looking at. What is the causing, what is the, what is the mechanism with excitation and contraction coupling? Are there other proteins that are involved in it besides the, the main ones, which you may or may not learn in class, but you learn exercise physiology. Uh, we are called DHP and reanidine receptors. There's a bunch of other receptors and proteins that are found uh, in that triad that's causing excitation and contraction coupling besides those main ones. And we're going to be looking at some of them. Right. So in detail, looking down deep in the muscle at the whole muscle contraction process, basically. Right. Wow. Um, well, I think that pretty much closes it out. Um, anything else you want to add about your lab? It's a great place to work. We always encourage undergrads to get involved in research. So if you're interested in more cellular work, you know, look me up. Well, how can people contact you if they have questions about your lab, your teaching, or your research? Uh, the best way to contact me is at my email uh, address, which is philku at ku.edu. In other words, philku at ku.edu. All right. Well, thanks for providing the lab tour today, explaining the type of research that you conduct here. And if you have any questions for me about the KU Exercise Science Program, uh, you can contact me through email, jtaylor at ku.edu, or you can call my office phone, 913-897-8516. Thanks for watching.